most of the stuff is built off of the American M48 chassis, which the Russians really copied. So that worked pretty well, you know, that uh, you could make it look like a Russian T-55 pretty easily, you know, or a T-72 or something like that, because it basically was a copy of an American frame. The characteristic of the T-72 is the, the, the slope of the front, the road, six road wheels, and the low profile turret that they had on them. So we had to make the turrets out of fiberglass with a reinforced metal roll cage in, inside there. And they all, uh, they're all on a turret race run by hydraulics to turn the, the turret and elevate the guns. They have a 125 millimeter uh, cannon, smoothbore cannon is what they call it. So we simulated that with, uh, with fiberglass and aluminum. One thing that was always fascinating to us, why would they put two big 55-gallon drums of gas in the back of the tank? That's a real thing that they had on the Russian tanks. Two big targets on the back. Yeah. <laughs> this tank probably was painted eight to ten times for different colors that we needed in the movie in Red Dawn over there. So it could be white summer snow, it could be the green, and then it could be the camouflage. So this tank probably doubled as about four tanks among with the rest of them. And then we had to, you know, acquire, you know, we had to make these things fire and that kind of stuff and get the machine guns to work on top of the tanks. Well, we, as we were building the tanks and stuff, we built in, you know, to the barrels of the guns and things where they could have uh, black powder packs and fire coming out the, the barrels of them. And they had some tremendous explosions. It was just unbelievable because we were in uh, New Mexico and out in the open nobody's around to bother you they had some really great explosions it's amazing but i can remember one incident where they came to my brother and i said now we want to blow up this tank and we want to do some damage to it and what will it do and so we went around and we looked they wanted to destroy the turret. Well, we said, well, if we destroy it, we'll have to get another one. But let's keep making the movie. Let's make this movie. So whatever happens, we'll worry about it later. Let's keep going. And boy, that tank took a hit. And uh, Ron and I says, oh, man, it's, it's, we've about lost that tank. But you know, there's nothing we couldn't fix or patch and make going and keep the, keep the movie going. So we worked with them and uh, it looked good. I remember one time on Johnson's Mesa, it was uh, 40 below zero. It was so cold that sometimes you couldn't get these things to even start and you'd have to build a fire under them just about. So it was, it was a challenging type thing to do, really. Look at your seat. Look at the steering wheel. Look at everything else. The pedals are lost in the snow. That's inside the tank. Yeah. We was all working in here in the, in the shop and in the yard here. And uh, the CIA drives in, these guys in these three cars. And uh, they'd been flying over here and got a report that we had these Soviet tanks and they could see them from the air. They wanted to know what we was doing with them. And so we, after we explained to them we were making them for a movie, uh, they thought, that, well, this would be okay. And then uh, when we got done with the show, brought all the vehicles back here, actually the, the, the same people called us and they wanted to use those tanks because they were really, really so real. They wanted to use them for signatures for the, the government, for their, their spy planes and stuff. Millie's did a really good job of making, making this, this movie believable. My lord, the napalm, I mean the explosives that, that it's like, I couldn't believe it. We learned that from Apocalypse Now, where we you fill a uh, you know, plastic tube, like a plumbing tube, and you fill it with gasoline and Tide, and then you wrap the whole thing in debt cord, and then you set it off in sections so that the whole thing will go up and kind of roll. It was pretty impressive. It was like being in, in, you know, in a war. The helicopters were, the Russians had, you know, reverse engineered and copied the Puma helicopter, the French Puma helicopter. And so we just got a couple of Pumas, or got more than, a, we got three of them, I guess. And we put appendages on them and everything else, got the FAA to give us a temporary, you know, certification so that we could fly them around as long as it wasn't over, you know, 
highly built up area because they didn't know whether these things were going to fall out of the sky or not. But they looked just like Heinz because they really were just like Heinz. And he wanted, the Russians had at that time uh, a particular helicopter, it was called the Heinz. And it was really a devastating helicopter. We, we had nothing like it. Uh, we do now, but we didn't then. It really was a striking resemblance to uh, the real thing, to the real Heinz. They're scary. I mean, they, when that, when that thing comes up and hovers, the, I mean, you, you're suddenly glad you're not in, the, in a real war with Russia. <laughs> These things were like scary. They were, uh, they were the way they were shaped. They were, and they come over the mountain, and they were just so real. And uh, it was just totally amazing to see these things recreated, you know, out of a, a different type of helicopter. And when you've seen all the vehicles and all that st action together, I mean, it, it really made that movie just what it is. It's really a, just a great movie. I think one of the biggest movies that uh, Renaud and I always cherish in our heart because it was like the making of a big war picture. And John and, and the whole crew and our tank crew, we put our whole effort into it. And I think it was one of our number one pictures we did. I enjoyed it. I always liked having the tanks next to my tent. I always liked getting on the tanks and riding off somewhere, you know, you know, standing in the turret of the tank, riding along through the snow. Makes you feel like Napoleon. It felt good to, to accomplish something that was that difficult. Las Vegas was the most central area to do all the things that I wanted. And I used a little bit of some of these, you know, canyons and things around Santa Fe. But basically, it was all around Las Vegas. And, it, and Las Vegas had a look of a sort of classic rural Midwestern town, too. The houses had a certain kind of Victorian look to them. There was the prairie on one side, the mountains on the other. It, it, it really seemed like an all-American town. We acted like we were taking over the town. The place is like one of the, the last supreme tourist spots uh, in the country. Everything's just like it was in, in the 1800s. It, they, they've never let the town develop. It stays just, you know, just the same. When the movie announced that they were coming, people were pretty excited about it. Here's a major film coming in. Of course, I don't know if anybody really knew who the stars were. I didn't. But the fact that they were going to be here for, for several weeks, filming and using locals to, to be stand-ins and all, it was, it was pretty exciting. There have been movies that come in and done scenes throughout the years, but this one was a whole production. And the whole town was excited. The whole city, you know, was permeated with the whole excitement of uh, the movie Red Dawn. And so it was, it was pretty exciting, actually. What they did to make the town look like a Midwestern town is, is they put this cowgirl up on one of the, the uh, buildings as you're coming in from the south side and it said, welcome to Calumet, this cowgirl, and her hand was um, an extension above the building and she was waving at people as they came in. I remember lots of streets being blocked off, um, lots of explosions happening, seeing buildings that, you know, before, I mean, they were old and falling apart but seeing them afterwards, you know, with the black marks and, and everything. Oh, the people were very happy to have us do that. They just thought that was great. They loved having World War III come to their town. It was very exciting. They moved around town painting little holes on things, barbed wiring, tanks rolling up and down the street. You know, what's not to be excited about something like that? And they really, even if you weren't in it, made you feel like you were part of this big party that lasted for four months. We took over the town and wrecked it. <laughs> but then invasions can be pretty hard on a town. He just made that town look like it had gone through World War III. And it was just all art direction, just paint, you know. Uh, they, they'd take old lumber and make it look like it, was, it had been burned and all that kind of stuff. And you go away one day, you come back a week later, and it's all blown up and burned to a crisp. Las Vegas pretty much became Red Dawn's soundstage. 
uh, a lot of Douglas Avenue, Grand Avenue, Railroad Avenue, pretty much all of downtown. They pretty much commandeered the whole town. The building of Lincoln Street, I think, was the most interesting because many of the buildings uh, going down the right-hand side were just single story and they built fake second story buildings and just to watch that process and then if you don't believe it when you see it done walk around the back because there's nothing there for the war scenes they went in and uh, put paint on the buildings to make it look like the buildings had burned in downtown area and uh, in the main portion of where they did the shooting and then on the other side there were several Tall buildings, two stories, with a one story in between, and they filled that in. And it was absolutely incredible. And on the left-hand side, they blew that up for reals. On the right-hand side, they built it blown up. So all the edges were jagged. And that, that was real fun. And in fact, it was kind of sad to see it all blown up because we all liked the way it looked. It was like, leave it, please. What they did to make the town look like a war zone, they put yes. tanks and and jeeps and, uh, it was just weird looking. Walking down the street, you, weren't, you didn't think you were in your same town. <laughs> the Plaza Hotel was pretty much base station for everybody. All the actors stayed there, uh, the director stayed there, and they found out real quick that it's haunted. In the midst of all that, I'm also dealing with a legitimately haunted hotel room where we were staying. I mean, legitimately, and I don't really believe in any of that stuff, but there was, so there was paranormal activity after work and then going, fighting, you know, Cubans and Russians at work. You can hear people walking around in the middle of the night when there's actually nobody in the hallways, hear noises, and they found that out real quick. And I finally went to the manager of the hotel. He said, well, there is a rumor that the original owner of the hotel um, murdered his wife and, and hid her body somewhere in either the, <laughs> one, of the, one of the walls or the floorboard or something, and that, that she does occasionally, you know, roam at night. It was, it was a lot. I was calling home a lot. We are standing on the road to Las Dispensas. On the corner up here by the highway is where the gas station was. Pretty interesting the way they did the gas station, make it look real enough to where tourists actually wanted to stop and put gas in there, but of course everything was fake, so. And down off to my right hand side is where the um, truck got shot when they were trying to head to the mountains and the infamous radiator scene. I'll leave it at that. Now get up here and piss in the radiator. Oh, check it out. All right. Middle school and the paratroopers were the first day of filming. It's burned in my brain. It was November 6th. There used to be a teacher here at Memorial Middle School in the, in the 80s. The paratroopers were coming in uh, from the north. They were dropping in, in this area. They're, the attempt was to get them to land in this field over here. However, because they were unable to land exactly on the field, they were overshooting their drops. So oftentimes they had to redo it several times in order for the landings to be perfect. I, I remember thinking, how in the world are the teachers keeping the kids focused when the, all of this is going on around them? And the, the airplane, I think it was a DC-3 flying over very low to let out the, the paratroopers out. And that was kind of fun. They used all kinds of different things there and people and classrooms and I was like, I wish I was going to school there just for that, just so I could see everything. I remember them coming in towards the, the school and uh, they would land on their bellies over here coming towards the school and then as they came into the school then they did their shooting into the building and I know that they were shooting at the, the teacher and the students in there so it was pretty exciting. Is a whorehouse where the revolutionary ideals of your forefathers are corrupted and sold. This is the Fort Union drive in, and this was the location of the concentration camp. The screen behind me is where they're showing the propaganda. Well, it was actually kind of interesting seeing all the propaganda on the screen, too. I mean, that was kind of new to us. During the height of all everything that was going on between us and Russia, it was kind of interesting to see everything up on the screen like that. It's kind of spooky. This is also where they blew up the two jets from the Wolverines. 
and they threw the grenade inside. The jets weren't actually supposed to be blown up here. The concentration camp was up in the mountains, of which they couldn't get to once it started snowing, so they brought the jets down. It was pretty interesting when they blew them up, because they, I think they knocked off either four or five trailers off their foundations. So it was an interesting day the next day after the explosions. They were many and loud, all those explosions, many and loud. And people kept showing up at the production office the next morning with their hand out saying, uh, three of my windows are broken, and they got paid up. But we knew they were coming, and uh, the scenes that they did up and down Grand Avenue, they were burning tires, so that made lots of black smoke. And to the people on the interstate just driving through town, uh, past town, must have been fascinating. Well, you know, nobody seems to be doing anything, and it looks to me like that town's on fire. <laughs> My sister got scared half to death of all the explosions. She thought it was a war. <laughs> My best explosion experience would probably be the helicopter with the RPG that shot. I was standing across the street when they blew those up and getting hit with glass, and that's how real they had it um, and how intense those explosions were. The buildings, of course, were fake and made just for that. But being able to stand that close to it, was that was an experience. While they were filming and setting up their pyrotechnics, there was no damage to any building that I know of. What they destroyed, they built to be destroyed. And it was carefully designed, carefully staged, the way they had safety in mind for their crew and for the cast members. We are on Highway 104, which is about 30 miles east of Las Vegas. And this is where they had the uh, tank scene where they threw the grenades inside of the, actually it was an armored personnel carrier, off of the cliffs up here on the top, and the execution scene off to the left over here. The biggest thing that I remember is the execution scene. That was the first time that I had actually seen something that looked that realistic with that much blood flying around and people dropping to the ground. That was pretty interesting. I guess what I really, um, I think about the movie was that the, that the, the background was so beautiful. It just really showed the beauty of our area over here, and the mountains and so forth. And so I, I think it really promotes this area as it is. It's pristine and beautiful. The location is definitely supposed to be, you know, a very strong character in the movie. It comes from watching John Ford films, I suppose. And I, and I you know, I feel that movies should be about wind and light and nature is always more present and stronger than human interaction even. All right, run, everybody get out of here! Actually, the scene of the hand flying out of a tank and getting shot was my hand. That was my 15 minutes of aim. My scene was just to walk into the bank and there's soldiers walking past me and other people walking past me. It's a weird feeling. <laughs> it was the most exciting. Since then, films that have come haven't made an impact. Not like Red Dawn. It just, it was the first really major movie to come in and use a good portion of Las Vegas. So it was, people were excited. And I even had a friend that um, tried to forge their autograph saying that she met all these guys. <laughs> I'm like, no, that can't be her signature. But it was, it was just very different, very exciting. We were pretty movie naive at the time. We'd had some smaller shots come in. Um, I don't think anybody was really expecting to have the entire town commandeered the way it was, but I think once they really started doing everything and doing the changes, and I think a lot of people enjoyed it. I mean, it's, it's still one of the talked about things in town, and. A lot of people had fun with it. And people still talk about it, and we'll find out we're getting a film. Is it as big as Red Dawn? Are they going to be here as long as Red Dawn? It's the measuring stick for everything that's come since. It just seems like we came out of the clouds and became something. Somebody valued Las Vegas for what it is. And, you know, you tell that to enough people and you begin to realize you do live in a special place. Of, uh, of kids who, in a very metaphorical sense, represented the sort of youthful, dynamic spirit of America, this can-do attitude. But then as the movie unfolded and they began to get 
into actual combat, the presumption is they were learning how to use the weapons that they were taking from the casualties and the conflicts. And from a storytelling standpoint, they were sort of teaching themselves as they went, I guess, how to learn to use this stuff. But as far as making the movie was concerned, they had to be taught uh, in order to act these parts and handle this uh, equipment, you know, the weapons. They have, they have to be taught how to do that. So they do it credibly on screen. Anybody got any questions so far? What's a flank? A deaf allay? Well, I took the actors, and like I do on all my films, where there are guns involved. Whenever you're dealing with guns, guns are very dangerous. So it's good to put the actors through a lot of training with, with the weapons, and then also train them to such a degree that you can train them live fire, where they actually shoot real guns. You know, the, the real guns at real targets and actually move in formation that way because they're not going to make mistakes with guns after that. Basically just took us through uh, the various weaponry, took us through broad stroke stuff involving tactical maneuvering or battlefield positioning or communication and all that stuff. We did have to go through a lot of training, and there were two mercenary soldiers that were consultants. They taught us a lot, and I believe we had the mock-up AK-47s in our hotel rooms, so we could learn how to break them down and put them back together again, and then at one point, went to a firing range, and there was every kind of gun you could imagine. The other part was that we had some Green Berets, they were friends of mine, who put them through some very harsh boot camp where they learn guerrilla techniques, and how to set ambushes, you know, how to avoid leaving a trail, this kind of thing. And a lot of it was a lot of Indian stuff. You know, they were a lot of Apache kind of lore that they learned. I remember Jennifer and I were both like terrified when we first started. Because imagine Charlie Sheen, 17. <laughs> Patrick, so, you know, we were all really young. Imagine us all with live ammo and machine guns and automatic pistols, all with live rounds. We were terrified, but by the end, Jennifer and I were really having a good time, especially with the pistols. We called ourselves the Wolverines, and uh, Red Dawn is when I realized how much fun this ca career was going to be because you get to be trained by uh, the best people in the world at what they do. So the training was really intense. It was all, you know, all military stuff with some of the uh, most intense mercenary special forces guys in the world, with hand-to-hand -hand combat training, uh, weapons training, explosives. I learned things I shouldn't know. <laughs> you know how to make bombs out of household goods. But we all took it really seriously. What Milius did was go to his longtime uh, friend, Fred Rexer, who had been in the military in Vietnam, and he evidently created a boot camp structure and a, a hands-on uh, tactical training scenario for all the actors, and uh, he taught them what they needed to know to look credible on screen. They learned how to walk the walk and talk the talk. We start very early, usually before the sun comes up. Uh, there is uh, intense physical training so that I can get their engines warmed up and get their attention focused. Generally, I don't feed them in the morning. We begin a training schedule that is intense from the time it starts. They may run three to five miles to get their heart pumping. Uh, now I've got their attention and we may go to work on weapons qualification, combat reloads, handling of the weapon, cover and concealment, individual tactical movement, patrol formations. It's driven by what the script demands and how much I can jam into that time. Then maybe I feed them, assuming they haven't pissed me off. And their days are filled with firing the weapon. Whatever weapon that I've got them tasked with, whatever weapon I've got them armed with, they fire that weapon. They get the feel of it. They learn about recoil. They learn about a rifleman's true position and all that sort of thing. They learn about firing a weapon weak hand and the utilization of cover. They learn all of these things so that it becomes second nature to them. They understand that that's part and parcel of a soldier's life in combat. That's how he lives. And that pays, that shows, because young actors are like sponges, dry sponges. And if you pour this experience into them, and if you lead by example, if you give them something to imprint on, you'll see that reflected in their performance. And then that performance becomes true. Then that performance becomes real. Go, Tony. After a week, they had another week or two before the movie started in which they just did exercises. They became the opposing force for the National Guard. Then they would hunt each other or go out and, you know, often they would go out at night and bivouac and things like that. And, 
you know, sleep over someplace. The harsher the weather, the better, that kind of thing. If I'm not mistaken, I think it was 80 below wind chill. 80 below. And so we had to cut holes in our in our gloves to to find the trigger in weather that cold but what they didn't what they couldn't train you is that for some reason the vibration of an automatic weapon in weather that cold generates frostbite there are a number of things that um, can add to your susceptibility to frostbite and I'm sure that's what Charlie meant just ask Charlie he'll tell you that whatever Captain Dye says is exactly what he meant but frostbite, you have to expose certain parts uh, of your body. For instance, uh, to get a good feel for the trigger, you might need to cut the ends off your gloves. Or that just may look cool, whatever you want to do. Uh, or it, your gloved finger may not fit inside the trigger guard. And so you, you have that piece of skin, a digit, uh, an extremity farther removed from your heart and lungs and your torso, you have that exposed and that can cause frostbite. You can get yourself into a frostbite situation with repeated firing of the weapon where you feel the impact constantly of recoil against your pectoral muscle or against your deltoid and you're driving the blood out once you keep pounding with that thing and if you're in a cold enough situation because that's dead numb and desensitized from the constant impact of recoil you won't notice how cold it's getting. It's numb anyway and so you become susceptible to frostbite. In cold weather, I have to work much more on the mental aspects of the soldier game than the physical aspects of the soldier game. I've got to teach you that you are not freezing despite what your body is telling you, that there are ways you can keep warm and teach you how to do that, and yet still keep in mind that the most important thing is to accomplish the mission and take care of the folks around you. That's a difficulty. It's hard. And I'm sure the guys on Red Dawn um, experience that to a great extent. So this is the battlefield, huh? It's a real war, kid. It's here every day. It was very interesting because none of these actors would ever join the military. But to do this in a movie, they gave it, you know, 150 percent. But these young men and women, uh, for the most part, want this experience. They want to see if they could hack it in the real world. Had the situation been different, if there still was a draft, could they have hacked it? Could they live and walk in the footsteps of great World War II era guys who did serve in the big war and then went on to become Hollywood stars? They all have that question in their mind. And that makes them desire to do this. It's a rite of passage in their young lives. I remember, <laughs> because Patrick was supposed to be the leader, I remember like knocking on their door in the middle of the night and they'd be like, Wolverines, we're going out. And we'd all grab our like guns and run around this little town of Las Vegas, New Mexico in the middle of the night, like lurking around buildings and stuff. It was big fun, insane big fun. The actors on this movie never complained in any way about it. They, they really enjoyed it. They took to it very quickly. I mean, the girls were field stripping the guns as quickly as the guys, and, and they really got into all this stuff. And they were like athletes in that they, they really took to it and wanted to test themselves, which was a good thing because once the movie started, they, they got more than they bargained for always in the back of your mind in the back of my mind is the idea of survival so it's good to learn these things because what if something like that did happen here you know I was happy to learn how to, to handle a gun and and the ideas and the tactics of how you survive when you have to we're free now free